Space, the final frontier. It's the one, my personal answer, my personal curiosity is just because I love seeing over the next horizon. I love seeing these strange new worlds. I like seeing how each one is is unique. Each of these worlds that begins as a point of light in space uh, turns out to be a place with its own unique geology and history and puzzles that we can solve by going to explore them. And every time we predict something, we wind up being surprised by what we find. So I do it because of that curiosity, the adventure, and uh, just being able to see through the eyes of robots in places that no human uh, in my lifetime will ever be able to explore. Mm. So, so that's my personal answer. But just because I'm curious isn't a good enough reason for me to demand that taxpaying public spend money on space missions. So there need to I be other you. reasons that's, than that. That's <laughs> excellent. I, that's what I want to get. That's what I want to get to. You know, for yeah. those of us that aren't so inclined that didn't write Transformers fanfic, <laughs> right? Why, why should we care? So there's a number of reasons. One is that it's immensely challenging, and the technological solutions that we develop to uh, solve and address those challenges of getting to these places, of maintaining spacecraft there, of of having small, powerful instruments, all of those developments that we do technologically to enable space exploration, that technology gets used on Earth in a wide variety of ways. And there have been many studies that have shown that when you invest money in the space program, you get a return on that investment that is many times what you put into it in terms of the value of the new technology you produce. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better, where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. Hey, welcome back to Think Bigger, Think Better. Let me ask you this. Have you ever read or listened to something so inspirational, not sad, that it makes you cry? When I was religious, it used to be Handel's Messiah. Maybe today, Keats' poetry. This next passage makes me cry tears of inspiration every time I read it. What's the background? When Voyager was 4 billion miles from home in 1990, Carl Sagan persuaded engineers at NASA to turn the craft's cameras back on Earth. Many questioned the necessity and advisability of this, but he prevailed. The image of a pale blue dot, no bigger than the stars you see in the night sky, inspired this. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives, the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner, how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, 
Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So why space? In 1970, a Zambia-based nun named Sister Mary Jacunda wrote to Dr. Ernst Stuhlinger, then Associate Director of Science at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. In response to his ongoing research into a piloted mission to Mars, specifically she asked, how could he suggest spending billions of dollars on such a project at a time when so many children are starving on Earth? It's a fine question and one we'll get into in the show a bit later. He tells the following story. About 400 years ago, there lived a count in a small town in Germany. He was one of the benign counts, and he gave a large portion of his income to the poor in his town. There was much appreciated because poverty was abundant during medieval times, and there were epidemics of the plague which ravaged the country. One day, the count met a strange man. He had a workbench in a little laboratory in his house, and he labored hard during the daytime so that he could afford a few hours every evening to work in his lab. He ground small lenses from pieces of glass. He mounted the lenses and tubes, and he used these gadgets to look at very small objects. The Count was so fascinated by the tiny creatures that could be observed with strong magnification, he invited the man to move with his laboratory to the castle to become a member of the Count's household and to devote henceforth his time to the development and perfection of his optical gadgets, quirky gadgets as a special employee of the Count. The townspeople were outraged when they realized that the Count was wasting his money, as they thought, on this stunt. We are suffering from a plague, they said, while he is paying this man for a useless hobby. But the Count remained firm. I give you as much as I can afford, but I will also support this man and his work, because I know that someday something will come out of it. Indeed, something very, very good did come out of this work, and also of similar work done with others in other places, the microscope. And it is well known that the microscope has contributed more than any other invention to the progress of medicine and the elimination of the plague and many other contagious diseases from parts of the world is largely a result of studies which made the microscope made possible, the germ theory of disease. And so that story is perhaps an apocryphal story, but a story of why space exploration may yield fruits that we cannot yet imagine. And today we explore space exploration with Emily Lakdawalla of the Planetary Society. She's just been awarded an honorary doctorate. She's most of top 25 best science blogs, and she's the editor of the Planetary Society magazine. So what's the Planetary Society? Well, their vision is to know the cosmos and our place within it, and to empower the world's citizens to advance space science and space exploration. It was founded in 1980 by Carl Sagan, Louis Friedman, Bruce Murray. They saw that there was public interest in space, but this wasn't reflected in government and government's budgets. And as NASA's budget was cut again and again, they decided to found the Planetary Society. Today, the Planetary Society is under the leadership of Bill Nye, quote-unquote Bill Nye, the science guy, and is the world's largest, most influential nonprofit space organization. The organization is supported by over 50,000 members in over 100 countries and by hundreds of volunteers around the world. So we're grateful to have Emily with us today. Emily, welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better. So, Emily, thank you for visiting with uh, Think Bigger, Think Better. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Cool. So, listen, I always start with this. It's kind of embarrassing, but tell us uh, something quirky with you. I've told everybody about your bio, but something that's perhaps off the bio that's unusual about yourself. I once had a letter published in the Transformers comic book saying that I wish that there were more female characters. And from that letter, they published my address and I had pen pals for the rest of my junior high and high school career. <laughs> Sorry, that's a, <laughs> that is surprising. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I also wrote a lot of Transformers fan fiction. Oh, did you really? I did. Back in, with all, back in the day in high school. With all my female characters, of course. I think that's so amazing. Wow. Now, we, wouldn't al- disc- we don't see that on your CV, so I'm glad I asked. <laughs> My alter ego was a, was a Decepticon who transformed into an SR-71 Blackbird jet. I'm embarrassed to know, even though geeky as I am, I don't know what an SR-71 Blackbird jet looks like, but there you go. All right. <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> stuff. All right. So, well, 
gosh, you already answered my first question. I was going to ask you what attracted you to the Planetary Society. Where else <laughs> could a high school girl go who's a transfor- rights transformer fanfic go but TBS? Now, why did you go to the TBS? <laughs> well, I've always been into science as well as art. And I went to college and became a geology major because it was such great fun. I went to Amherst College, which is in central Massachusetts. We had all of our labs were outdoors with the fall color. And it was just, it was just stunning. And the school is an, a uh, liberal arts school. And the geology was the science that had, I think, the least amount of math. So all of these, you know, history majors and English majors and music majors, they would also take geology classes. And many of them would get sucked into a geology major along with me. So it was a really dynamic group of students. I love geology very much. But I didn't want to do research. I didn't want to become an academic. I thought perhaps I would become a science museum curator or something like that. But for grad school, I wound up going into planetary science because who wouldn't love studying geology and other planets? And I was actually looking for work in the museum field when I stumbled across a job posting for the Planetary Society, and I've been there ever since. That is so cool. And we're coming up. I shouldn't say to people, but uh, it's coming up for your 20th anniversary, not too long from now. So congratulations on that. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that I've been here that long. But yeah, I think uh, space is dynamic enough that it's always fun. Yeah, it's great. Well, these days, nobody stays in anything for 20 years, marriages, jobs, (laughs) political office, thank God. It's funny that you mentioned that because I got married right before I joined the Planetary Society. So both of those things have lasted the same amount of time. And hopefully, uh, if there's any change in my employment, it won't change my marriage status. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, then, cool. So your job is part artist, right? I mean, I you're a scientist and someone who's an advocate for public understanding of science, but you're also an artist curating beautiful images. Is that is that accurate also? Yeah, I, I see myself as an artist working with the space image data. All these spacecraft that travel all over the solar system, almost all of them have cameras. And the pictures they return are beautiful on their own. But sometimes the images could, with just a little bit of work, be made really beautiful. And so I apply various Photoshop techniques, uh, as simple as cropping and t- contrast. But sometimes some of these images require quite a bit of work. There may be image blemishes, cosmic ray hits. There may be images that have been taken through multiple filters that you can combine to make color views. And there's all kinds of other fun image processing work that can take this raw space data and make really gorgeous pictures. And I love to do that. I also love to support the community of international space image data artists who are working on the same day that I am and often to much greater effect. And so I started a gallery, a a database really of amateur process space images that I host on the Planetary Society's website. It's named for Bruce Murray, who was one of our founders. And mm-hmm. and the reason that there was a camera on the Mariner missions to Mars, so that's very appropriate. And so the Bruce Murray Space Image Library now is the largest repository, I think, of amateur process space images and has some really glorious and unique pictures you won't find anywhere else. You know, we don't think of that as art, right? You know, think of art as like Picasso-y stuff and everything like that. That's quite extraordinary. And, you know, art, of course, is limited to what the human vision, that part of the electromagnetic <laughs> spectrum that we can see with our eyes. And here we have art that's based, I assume, on infrared photography, on radio telescope imagery, on ultraviolet photography, I guess all of that, right? That's right. Most of the the spacecraft images that we see are in either visible wavelengths or near infrared wavelengths. And so that's not too far beyond what humans can see, but it still does depend upon solar illumination. So the images still look pretty familiar, even if they're taken in infrared wavelengths. But yes, you, you get to see information from parts of the spectrum that the human eye is not sensitive to. But of course, you can only present it in parts of the spectrum that human eyes are sensitive to. So you have what are called false color images, where you you've taken information from the ultraviolet or infrared parts of the spectrum and kind of smooshed it down into visible wavelengths so that human eyes can actually study it. Which is cool, which is great, and which is art. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So which part of your job do you like best? Which is the most rewarding? I think, you know, the pictures, it always comes back to the pictures. Processing pictures always makes me happy, but sharing those and makes me happy. Sharing them and being kind of a nexus in this community. I'm sort of in the middle of the amateur image data processors. And then I also participate in the professional planetary science community. They often don't have those artistic skills, but they need images to illustrate their work. And so I love being able to serve as kind of to to help connect um, the amateurs and the professionals I also just really like being able to uh, help people do their work better. And so a lot of the time I'll go to a 
a scientific conference and I'll see somebody using a slide that I'm like, oh, that's not a very good image here. I can give you something better. And so I've produced a bunch of slides that show comparisons of moons and planets and of asteroids and comets, the kinds of images that I see showing up in talks all the time. And, and I can make those talks beautiful and more effective by giving them better illustrations. That's very cool. Are you responsible for any of these amazing colorification of these amazing nebula images that we've seen? Well, I don't do very much personally with the with astrophotography. I'm really very much a planetary scientist. I'm a geologist. And so I'm most interested in the worlds that I can imagine doing geology on. So that includes the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, as well as our moon. It also includes all the outer solar system moons, things like Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and Triton, and Titan, and Enceladus, and Tethys, and Rhea, and, and Miranda. There's so many of them out there. I love all those little worlds. And so that's the kind of data that I tend to focus on. Yeah, you know, I read uh, something very interesting on the internet as I was preparing for this or something about that, about we should be thinking about colonizing Titan before we're thinking about colonizing Mars. How <laughs> Titan was in many ways a better candidate and it had beautiful images of Titan, which I, I think is remarkable that we can, you know, I mean, that's just an incredible thing. I don't know uh, about so, that. You know, it would take so much longer to get to Titan than it would to get to Mars. Titan is really very far out there. It's Saturn's, you know, about 10 AU from the sun. That's a long way away. <laughs> is it Mars is uh, nine months, right? Titan's what, four or five years, maybe longer? Yeah, something like that. I mean, it depends on how you go and how powerful your rocket is and everything else. But uh, we haven't had humans survive in space for long enough to get them to Mars and back, much less to Saturn and back. Yep, 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 yep. So let me ask you this, the spiritual question, if you will, why explore, well, it's not just got a spiritual answer, it's kind of a spiritual question, is uh, is why explore space? Why are we doing that? Well, I'll give you a couple of different answers. The one, my personal answer, my personal curiosity is just because I love seeing over the next horizon. I love seeing these strange new worlds. I like seeing how each one is is unique. Each of these worlds that begins as a point of light in space uh, turns out to be a place with its own unique geology and history and puzzles that we can solve by going to explore them. And every time we predict something, we wind up being surprised by what we find. So I do it because of that curiosity, the adventure, and uh, just being able to see through the eyes of robots in places that no human uh, in my lifetime will ever be able to explore. Mm. So, so that's my personal answer. But just because I'm curious isn't a good enough reason for me to demand that taxpaying public spend money on space missions. So there need to be other you. reasons that's, than that. That's <laughs> excellent. I, that's what I want to get. That's what I want to get to. You know, for yeah. those of us that aren't so inclined that didn't write Transformers fanfic, <laughs> right? Why, why should we care? So there's a number of reasons. One is that it's immensely challenging, and the technological solutions that we develop to uh, solve and address those challenges of getting to these places, of maintaining spacecraft there, of of having small, powerful instruments, all of those developments that we do technologically to enable space exploration, that technology gets used on Earth in a wide variety of ways. And there have been many studies that have shown that when you invest money in the space program, you get a return on that investment that is many times what you put into it in terms of the value of the new technology you produce. That's one reason. Another one is that, you know, space is like dinosaurs. It's very easy to get people excited about it. And just as every kid who plays baseball in school isn't going to be a professional baseball player, but yet they learn all the value of teamwork and sportsmanship and physical fitness and all of that. Not every kid who wants to be an astronaut or the next Neil Tyson is going to become a planetary scientist, but they'll learn science. They'll learn about how to solve scientific problems. They'll learn about how to address things from a scientific point of view, and they'll be much better and more informed constituents than they would have been if they had avoided science. So space science and exploration, I think, are inspiring to, to children to, to lead them into, into science and technological careers. That's yeah. A, sort of a, so yeah, sort of a very good reason. Very good reason. Mm -hmm. What about money? Is there money in space? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So probably sometime in the future, yes. But if you're asking about things like space mining and stuff like yes. that, those sorts of activities will, I believe, only make economic sense if what you're mining is going to be put to use in a future space economy. All right. So, okay. Yeah. So you're not going to go to space to mine some material and then bring it back to Earth. I think 
Um, what about rare earth, rare earth metals, for example, like that? We're running out of those, you know, that we have in our phones every day. Every I think month. it'd be a lot cheaper and better for everyone to develop new technology alternatives to the use of rare earth metals than it would yeah. be to go out and crunch up asteroids to get at the tiny quantities of rare earth metals that they contain. So I think that in, space mining makes sense if what you want to build is a space economy of more mines and people out there working the mines and, and people out there living in space and doing things in space. And I think I think humanity's future does lead in that direction. But I, I it's hard to see a business case right now for right. bringing the stuff back to Earth. So we'd want a space ecosystem, but you don't do the mining first as part of a, you know. Well, maybe you do. I mean, maybe maybe you invest in that just because you think it's interesting and you want to bring about that future faster. And you want to be one of the leaders in that development. I think that all of those are valid reasons to do it. You know, we don't have to invest in economy just because we want to get rich. We can also do it because we want to leave our mark on the future of of what humans do in space. And so those are those are all valid reasons as well. That's cool. How, did you finish? I may have interrupted you as you were about to offer a third reason for why explore space. You, were, you talked about the inspirational value, if you want, for a, a young generation of scientists who see right. themselves perhaps doing something like this. Was there a third reason? I can't remember. Yes. You know, research and science and space, we do it in part because we're curious about the other worlds, but it's also because it'll teach us about our own planet as well. The history of our planet, the future of our planet, the kinds of science that we're doing on Earth right now in terms of trying to understand climate change. A lot of that was developed in order to study the weather and climate of other planets. And by studying other planets and testing our models against other planets, we can help to protect our own. By studying the sun, we can learn to protect ourselves from and mitigate the effects of solar storms. By looking for and discovering asteroids, we can potentially uh, discover a hazardous one to us while we still have time to do something about it. So it's also about protecting our own planet. Very, very good. Well, public is paid for, as you rightly say, from public monies, mostly, for now, anyway. And public enthusiasm seems to ebb and flow. So I guess... What's your barometer reading of where it is now? And and let me ask you this from a funding point of view. Is there a trade-off in the research agenda between stuff that the public gets excited about and will endorse and stuff of scientific value, basic research? How much are the people who are you know, creating these 10 and 20 and 30 year projects sensitive to what the public has got appetite for paying for? Well, of course, scientists are not all one block. There's a lot of different kinds of scientists out there. I do find that space scientists tend to be more outspoken than other kinds of scientists I encounter just as in general about the importance of giving back to the public that paid for their science. So most, not all, but most planetary scientists are committed to doing public outreach, to giving talks, to appearing in classrooms, to sharing their data, to telling their stories, and making sure that the public understands what's going on with their space missions. Yeah, that's fascinating to me because that, like that, because it's not just because it's the big bucks, right? I mean, space isn't necessarily any bigger than building a uh, the uh, CERN, for example, par- particle accelerators or the LIGO or anything like that. So why is it that space scientists have this sort of deep commitment to public understanding of science and public support for for their work? Why is that? I'm not really sure why. I think it's just part of the culture of planetary science. I think that uh, a lot of these people were inspired to study. You know, you don't generally as a kid wake up and say, I want to be a planetary scientist. Usually there's a a moment of of spark, of inspiration to study, go study space because it inspired you as a kid. And so I just think that people in general want to give back. You know, there's both an altruistic reason and a self-serving reason because it is spacecraft are kind of expensive and it takes public support. Support, people are aware that they have to stoke public interest in order to make sure that the public continues to advocate for the future of space exploration. But I, people just genuinely love talking about their planetary science work. I do think that there are sometimes there is a little bit of a disconnect between what scientists want to do next and what the public wants to see next. So right. I think that, like I mentioned before, that uh, Bruce Murray was was visionary in saying we need to put cameras on spacecraft because we need to show the public what Mars looks like up close, and that'll help the public understand why we're doing what we're doing. We've recently seen the first Mars mission to go to Mars without a camera. That was MAVEN. It's studying the upper atmosphere of Mars and didn't need a camera. But you have to ask, you know, is it really serving the public as well as if it had a camera? 
it's interesting to compare that to the Juno spacecraft, which is at Jupiter. It's studying the deep interior of Jupiter and also did not need a camera. But I think pretty much everybody on the Juno mission agreed it would be a crime to send a spacecraft all the way to Jupiter without a camera. And so they put on a very small one just for the purpose of taking images that would be useful for public outreach. So Juno Cam isn't technically a science instrument. It doesn't have a science team. They put their data out there for the public to process, and the public has risen to the challenge and and produced really gorgeous images from this public camera. And so I think there are missions out there. There are goals that the scientific community has that are good goals for science, but it's a lot harder to get the public excited about them if you're studying magnetospheres and solar wind and you know, atmospheric constituents, you can explain why all of those things are very important scientifically, but it can be a little bit tougher to get the public enthused about them. Well, do you know what I'm thinking about this? I mean, this is kind of a, an opinion that I've just formed, so it may not be very, very valid, but that there's almost a template here because there's a sort of, I'm a very much a pro-science guy. A lot of my show is public understanding of science. But one of the things is there's a level of entitlement, perhaps you might say, with scientists who, you know, many of whom still you know, spend taxpayer bucks, yeah. National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation. And there's not this deep sort of almost you call a spiritual commitment to making sure that their work is understood in the public sphere. There's almost a, uh, I, I find it disturbingly, particularly with climate science. So there's a sort of a trust me, I, it's not strictly true, but mm-hmm. trust me, I'm an expert or the Centers for Disease Control and not really willing to invest the time that planetary scientists and space scientists do in really getting the public excited and behind them. Uh, maybe it'd be unfair to ask you to comment on that, but well, it strikes me as a... One of the things that I will say about that is that space science, in a lot of ways, is a lot easier to explain. I mean, so the science is always motivated by questions. And so right. the questions that we're asking in space science, you know, the answers may be difficult to come by, but the questions are very easy to explain. Things like, why is Venus different from Earth? You know, yeah. Anybody can look at Venus and look at Earth and say, those are the same size, they're made of the same stuff, but they're very different right now. Why? And that is actually yeah. a motivating question behind Venus research. Similarly, you know, are we alone in the universe? Or is there life elsewhere? That is another fundamental motivating question in planetary science, and it's very easy for everybody to understand. Whereas the kinds of questions that are being asked now in health research and you know other lines of research are it's much more difficult even to explain the question in a lot of ways. Physics is impenetrable to most people. <laughs> well, you know, it, it doesn't have to be quite that impenetrable. And I think that scientists in general should do a better job of trying to step back and help people understand that, how their research fits into the big picture. But I think it's one of the things that attracts a lot of us to planetary science is that you can talk about it at parties. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, well, let's get down to some nitty gritty stuff here. Tell me a little bit about the cool projects that the TPS is uh, working on right now. I'm also curious, like how it's funded. And I'm specifically interested in how people, listeners who are so inspired might contribute. So, so like what's hot and what can people do to support some of that? Well, the Planetary Society is a nonprofit organization. It's the world's largest non-governmental space interest organization with more than 50,000 members in, I think, more than 100 countries. And so we're primarily funded by the dues and the donations of those members. Everybody pays an annual membership fee, and then we we do appeals uh, year round to help fund specific projects. What's that? A few hundred bucks, or what is it? How much is it? No, it's much cheaper than that. I think it's about fifty bucks. It depends on where you live, and there's student memberships and so on. And yeah. so. Actually, you know what? So- That's wrong. It no longer depends on where you live. Our membership fee is now the same for both Americans and for United States residents, and for everybody else. Well, it's the price of a steak dinner. Let's, yeah. let's get right down to it. Ain't much. A cheap steak dinner, actually. <laughs> steak, steak, dinner for, steak dinner for one. <laughs> so it's not a lot of money. So there's three main areas that we focus our efforts. That's on exploring the solar system, on searching for mm-hmm. life in the universe, and on mm-hmm. protecting our planet from the hazards that exist in our solar system, primarily hazardous asteroids. And so So talk us through those three. Yeah. So exploring the solar system, we do things like advocate for uh, more space missions, for more funding for space missions. So our, our advocacy is primarily focused on that. And primarily the advocacy is directed in the United States because it's the biggest spender and also because voters have such a, a direct ability to get in touch with their 
lawmakers and actually express an opinion and be listened to. It's really surprising how few voters it takes to place those phone calls to have an effect on their elected representatives. So there's that. We also educate people about what's what's going on in space exploration and try to get them involved through various contests, things like naming contests. We ran the contest that named the asteroid that's being visited by the OSIRIS-REx mission. It's called Bennu. So that's the kind of stuff that we do in exploring our solar system. The Search for Life, we were one of the founding organizations behind the SETI at Home project that chopped up radio signals and sent them around to people's computers for their screensavers to use to look for signals from space. So that's SETI, the, SETI, the SETI project? Yeah, that's part of the SETI uh, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence project. But most of our work on life in the universe is not about finding ET. It's about finding any evidence that life originated elsewhere or exists elsewhere. So we're not talking about little green men and spaceships. We're talking about uh, microbes, maybe, that may once have lived on Mars or may currently live in Europa or Enceladus or any of the places that we think might harbor life. Or just organics, right? I mean, more complex organic molecules, right? Well, organic molecules actually occur naturally without life being involved. Organic molecules are just ones that contain a lot of carbon covalently bonded to other materials like oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur. And so there's a lot of asteroids, meteorites that contain a lot of that material. It rains down on us all the time. And those would have been the primordial- Uh, Peptides or small proteins or amino acids or or as far along as that or more like methane and- No, there are actually quite large naturally occurring hydrocarbons, organic molecules, things like there are some peptides that, that occur naturally, the simpler ones. There are also these things called, let's see- Poly, oh no, I'm not going to remember, PAHs, uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, but they're polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So they're polyaromatic uh, something. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So these are, these are carbon rings that form and bond to each other and form these very large molecules that are all naturally occurring. So this would have been the material that would have been raining down on all the planets, providing the building blocks potentially for life to originate, not just on Earth, but also elsewhere, like perhaps Mars, even Venus or or Mercury early in their in the solar system's life cycle could potentially have harbored life, although they're very inhospitable to life right now. Well, polycyclic hydrocarbons is, uh, you know, DNA, right? I mean, cholesterol, I mean, you know, so I mean, some of that modified in our bloodstream, right? That's kind of, I think. (laughs) Yeah, the cholesterols and things I think are long chain hydrocarbons. So they're kind of oils and fats and things like that. But yeah, this stuff occurs everywhere. And so the question is, you know, can you find, did there ever form some kind of microbe that could have used that material as its food, basically, and started to develop a self-replicating little bit of biology on some other world? So how far along are we? How far along are we from the claim that, yes, there once was or there now is life outside our <laughs> outside Terra? And, I, you know, both in two ways. How close are we to being able to categorically answer that question? And then uh, if we can answer it positively now, how long might it take us to do so? Well, of course, it's impossible to prove a negative. So of course. Uh, we've been looking for a long time uh, and we have not found any slam dunk evidence for life elsewhere. We have identified, thanks to recent planetary missions, we've identified a large number of places that are interesting places to look for life. So we've gotten better, for instance, in our understanding of Mars geology and history. So we know how old the rocks are that we need to go look in to look for fossil evidence of life. We've identified, thanks to the Cassini mission, some really exciting new possible places where life might currently exist in the solar system. The number one being Enceladus. So Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. It's a very small moon. It's only 500 kilometers across, but it has these geysers that it shoots into space from its South Pole all the time. And Cassini flew through those geysers and found out that they have chemical evidence for hot springs. So you have salt water in contact with hot rock. So that gives you hot rock being hot because of geologic activity. So that gives you all the ingredients you need, as far as we know, for life and an apparently stable environment for it to exist in. So that's a really exciting place to go look. Now, we don't have a mission out there that can look, but they certainly have been proposed, and I'm sure we'll see one in the future. I just don't know how long it will take. And that's the a theory about where life on Earth would have formed, which is in volcanic sub I think in the ocean, right? right? Is that correct? Yeah. So, yes. uh, so a lot of the kinds of chemistry you get, um, you get 
uh, a lot of out of equilibrium chemistry. What that means is that you have you have stuff that wants to react basically, and whenever you have that, yeah. you have just a really good environment to you, you have food basically. Uh, that out of balance chemistry is food for microbes, and so um, that's why the the deep sea ocean vents on Earth are so rich with life. And so that's the kind of environment that we think you might potentially see life having originated or at least thriving in the current solar system. There's some other research that indicates that you might actually need periods of drying out in order to initiate yep. the yep. development of life, in which case volcanic fumaroles are better. And a place like Europa or Enceladus are not so good because they'd never have dried out. And that's why you might want to look on Mars because Mars certainly has dried out many times and also has had lots of volcanic activity with lots of groundwater. So that could have been a good place for life to initiate. Very cool. Are those um, volcanoes, that's not the word you used, on Enceladus, are they hot? What's the what's the temperature? Because you need some heat for it to react, I guess, to help the reactions along. Are Absolutely, you know, any, anywhere you have volcanism, anywhere you have rock being right. stressed, and and you have quite a bit of heat, so you could have pretty high temperatures down there. We know that at the surface, some of the vents are pretty close to the melting temperature of water. You know, it's very cold out there in the outer solar system. But those vents, Cassini measured their temperatures, and and it sure looks like there's liquid right underneath it, and that's that's plenty warm. That is amazing. So that was the third thing was searching for uh, life outside uh, Terra. What about protecting Terra from an asteroid? What about that? Your so third? there's a couple of ways that you can do this. And the, the main two things that we focus on are one, discovering the potentially hazardous asteroids. And so actually, the best thing you can do to reduce the risk from asteroid impact is to find and track asteroids that might be dangerous. And virtually all of the time, you discover a potentially hazardous asteroid, further tracking of it reveals, nope, in fact, it's not going to hit us after all. And so, <laughs> yeah, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. And so we've been advocating for and helping with the discovery of lots and lots of asteroids. We've helped to find all the biggest ones, the ones that could, you know, kill all life on Earth. We found the ones that could probably kill human civilization on Earth, and we're working our way smaller to the like the continent killers, down to the city killers, down to the you know. So yeah. there's still a lot out there to be discovered, but we've retired some of the biggest risks that way. What happens if something's yeah. on the way though? Can we do so that's about the that? other part of the problem is uh, if we do find yep. something that is after tracking determined to be heading our way, what can we do about it? And if we have enough lead time, there's actually a lot of different things you can do. Because, you know, a, a near Earth asteroid will have an orbit that takes it about, you know, somewhere between one and five years in order to go around the sun. And so if you can give it just even the tiniest of nudges now, you can change its orbit yeah. enough so that that time that it might have come around and impacted us, it actually won't anymore. And so we're pursuing a lot of different yeah, cool. technologies to do that. There are things where you can have little spacecraft that shoot lasers at an asteroid to ablate some of the surface and make it help impart a little bit of a push to the asteroid that way. You can have a gravity yeah. tug, which is a heavy spacecraft that sits in space close to the asteroid, but doesn't even touch it. That's just kind of pulling on it very gently with its own gravity, and that helps shift its orbit. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Just the, just the weight of the, the gravity generated by the mass of the Exactly. Of the you, you can also yeah, color yeah, uh, one side of the, you could like launch something that covers, basically covers one side of the asteroid in chaff, something very reflective, and the solar light pressure right. will nudge the asteroid. And all of these things, they're very slow. They're very slight changes. That's, that, isn't that's it very neat? cool. But they, over time, they'll cause enough of a change to move the asteroid out of a, a hazardous orbit. There's actually one more thing you have to do, though which is that let's say you discover an asteroid that is on an impact course for the United States and the United States sends up a ship that makes sure that it won't hit the US but you know maybe it'll hit slightly later and it'll hit China instead okay so that's obviously not a solution that anybody really wants but there's obviously some diplomacy that you have to work to make sure that the world is working together to mitigate these threats together so that mitigating a threat to one country isn't imposing a threat to the people in another country we want everybody to be safe we want all of the planet to be safe from asteroids and so we're going to make sure that there aren't uh, unilateral actors here that are going to just deflect the danger somewhere else. 
Well, no, well, we've got a very good way of taking out France, though. For sure. <laughs> I don't have anything against the French. <laughs> they make very nice space instruments. <laughs> what about uh, Bruce Willis? Can we ever do anything like that? <laughs> you know, it's so hard and complicated <laughs> to send uh, humans. You need to have a real good reason for it. Now, I can see a real good reason for human ingenuity, you know, because you don't really know what you're going to find when you visit the asteroid. You know, maybe by the time we discover a hazardous asteroid, it will be far enough in the future that we have much better capability to fly humans around space. But for now, your best bet is uh, robots. They're cheap, they're fast to build, they're easy to launch. And when you're talking about flying one clo- to something that passes close to Earth, it's really easy to get to that target too. So you could launch a, a ton, a little spacecraft, and they could all work together or survey the asteroid, do all kinds of stuff. So yeah. How much you're talking about getting like five or 10 years? Yeah, ideally, or even more than that. Ideally, you have 100 years of warning. But yes, you can do all of these things that I described with, like you say, 10, 20 years of warning. Five is beginning to get a little close because you still have to build and launch a spacecraft. So, and that takes time. So hopefully we have at least 20 years of warning before one of these things is going to hit us. Okay, cool, 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 cool. All right. Okay. I'm going to take a detour and then we're going to talk a little bit about Mars. I'm a Marsaholic. What are the top two space movies of all time? <laughs> oh, geez. You know, I'm not such a movie holic. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, Interstellar, The, Mar- the Martian, Red seen, Mars. I haven't I mean, seen blah, blah, Interstellar. Blah, blah, blah. I read, so I, I read more science fiction. And so I have um, some favorite hard science fiction books, like the Red Mars trilogy by Kim Stanley Robinson is- uh, I was going to yeah. ask you about that. Are you- Anne, are you a red? <laughs> it's been a long time a since I read them. I think I'm a red, though. I think that I'm uh, I'm the sort of person who doesn't want to leave such major changes behind me. I think that uh, I'm not entitled to Mars. Mars yeah. has been there for a long time, and it's going to be a long time there after I go. And yep. so I want to make sure that my descendants aren't cursing my name for any rash actions I took during my lifetime. God help us. You know, for people who don't know, that's also my favorite trilogy, mm-hmm. Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. I'm actually rereading it for the third time now, and it's uh, I think it's 1,700 pages in total. And are you a red or a green? There are those who want to terraform Mars and make it Earth-like, which in the around 2100, that's uh, highly achievable. And then there's a faction which want to keep Mars red, which they, there's a certain beauty and a side, certain – how would you describe it? A certain, and there's certain, not a certain beauty, but a certain – a moral right. obligation to leave Mars, leave Mars be Mars. Yeah, that's right. So that's the tussle. That's my favorite trilogy. I'm literally, re- I'm halfway through Blue Mars now, actually rereading Blue Mars for the third time. All right. You've never seen Interstellar, which means we should end the show right now. <laughs> that's, uh... I have seen The Martian and a lot of people ask me what I think about it because, you know, obviously there are inaccuracies and things like that. But those kinds of things don't bother me in movies, especially I feel that the things that were not quite accurate in The Martian were inaccuracies chosen for the express purpose of making it a better movie. And far be it for me to say you have to make this movie more dull or the film look worse because the spacecraft doesn't look quite right. I like the spacecraft. It's pretty. Well, it's doing its job. And by the way, Interstellar is all about <laughs> exoplanets. Uh, you, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a very cool movie. It might even be up there <laughs> among my favorites. But anyway, I won't try and persuade you. I'm sure, I'm sure other mm-hmm. people have said that to you. What would you say to a Marsaholic? You know, there are people who are, I think there are people that think we can get a human on Mars by 2030 and a colony by 2035. Uh, you know, what's your view on, first of all, is that a worthy goal? for a spacefaring civilization to pursue in that sort of timeline. And I know those kind of timelines are realistic in any, in any sense. Well, my bad. personal point of view is uh, what's the rush? I think that uh, Mars being one of the places where we think life may once have begun and where it may even exist now, Mm -hmm. it's going to be much harder to tell Mars life from Earth life if we have contaminated Mars with a lot of Earth life. What's that? Already have, right? Is that right? Well, we certainly we have, have right? um, that- transported microbes to Mars, but I, I think it's an open question whether the microbes have actually set up shop there and uh, successfully eaten and reproduced and done all the things that microbes have to do to be called life. So I'm not in any hurry. I also think that I want to make sure that we're going with a philosophy that will include everybody in this adventure, that it isn't just a few you know wealthy venture capitalists who are... I want everybody to be involved. And I also, I just want to, I want it to be done with thoughtfulness, you know, so that we're not despoiling something we are, as you say, letting Mars be Mars. And that our, again, our descendants won't curse our names for whatever we did to pollute the planet. So I'm not in any particular hurry. 
one of the things that now that I want to make very clear that that's my personal point of view. It's not the view that's held by the planetary society. The planetary society, they're more of a descriptivist than a prescriptivist when it comes to goals in space. We represent sure. a large number of people and a, yep. and a large proportion of yep. our membership is very excited about sending humans to Mars. And so our point of view and the, the center of our advocacy is how can we do that? What's the most reasonable first step? We do believe that working in near Earth space, places like the moon, are can be important stepping stones on the way to Mars, but we also don't want them to be to get stuck. We think that Mars is the destination. We think that there are intelligent ways to go about doing the first human mission where you wouldn't actually put the humans on the surface of Mars. You would have the humans in orbit teleoperating uh, robots on the surface. And that would get around these uh, contamination concerns. It would take advantage of the human brain power problem solving skill by being able to operate rovers and re- or other vehicles in real time, uh, which we can't do right now with Mars. Yeah. But it would also allow you to not have to face all the difficult and expensive problems of getting the humans safely on the surface with a large enough habitat to live in that is self-sufficient and then bring them back. So we'd build it from orbit, basically, what you're saying in real time. We'd build it from orbit and you'd operate from orbit. You'd have a station in orbit that would be a comfortable, survivable kind of space, the kinds of which we've we've sort of built before, although the International Space Station is far from self-sufficient. We have a lot of technology development to do to make a truly self-contained human habitat. We don't have that yet. And so we also support the kinds of technology development that you need to do in order to make us more ready to do that kind of deep space exploration. Sure, sure. And why not a self-sustaining habitat first on the moon? Because I mean, if something goes wrong on the moon, you're only a few days away, you can, you know, whip people off the surface. That's right. You could do it today, right? Probably if you had to, right? (laughs) You know, Yeah, it's a really good place to practice and develop all that technology for self-sustaining habitats. And now we have water, right? Now we now we're you know a hundred percent we have water. So so self-sustaining is uh, well more within reach than it was before we had water, right? I mean, and you know you mentioned asteroid mining to me early on. One of the most valuable things that you can mine from asteroids in space for use in space is water. Uh Um, Asteroids are full of water and that water can be used to, astronauts need water, but we also can use it to make hydrogen and oxygen, which is a fuel, the oxygen that we need to breathe. The water is a very useful shield against radiation. So it sounds weird, but one of the main goals for asteroid mining for the future of humans in space is, is getting water. Very much, very much. So what do you think if I asked you to open up a crystal ball or what do you think? When do you think the first human will set foot on Mars? And when do you think the first self-sustaining colony might exist on Mars? What would your, I'm just asking you to cast the dice here or, or look at your crystal ball. I mean, you don't, I won't call you back in five years and say, ha ha, <laughs> you're, you're wrong. So I'm always a little ornery and try to come up with something that will surprise you. And it's not necessarily the most likely thing I think, but I think it is highly probable that the first human to reach the surface of Mars will be dead when they get there. Because it's a big challenge. If people are in a a real hurry and are not addressing the risks, there's so many different ways that a landing on Mars can go badly. There's a lot of different ways that the journey to Mars can go badly. And so especially if it's the kind of company, if it's a private company that doesn't plan on bringing the astronauts back, yeah, which is you know the kind of thing that I that you've seen proposed in many places. You know, the, the first landing may well be they died on on route, or they died from the rigors of landing, or the spacecraft didn't survive the landing, and they splatted and sent human guts all over the place on the surface of Mars. So that's my prediction. I know it's not um, it's not a happy one, <laughs> um, but I think it's important to throw that out there though, so that people understand. I mean, this is an incredible challenge. It will be more challenging than anything humanity has ever done before. And when you face challenges like that, you face great risks and you have to be willing to face up to the consequences of your bets going badly. Well, better than, so let's take it, let's go back to the United States in 1961 and the risk of trying to send someone to the moon by 1970. Would you think that here in 2018, the risks of trying to send someone to Mars by, I don't know, 2035 are greater than the trip to the moon looked at 1961? What would you say about that? It's really hard for me to compare because, of course, technology has changed so much. 
we have so many advantages technologically that the Apollo astronauts didn't have. But on the other hand, when you have a, a clockwork spacecraft, there's uh, <laughs> there's a lot less software to go wrong. You know, there's that famous photo of uh, oh, what's her name, the woman programmer who wrote the code that sent the astronauts to the the moon and helped the one uh, from Hidden, Hidden Figures, the woman, the star uh, of Hidden no, Figures. No, uh, this is a different. Uh, oh shoot, Margaret Hamilton, I think. Um, anyway, she's standing next to this stack of paper that's as high as her, and that was all of the code that was written in order to send the astronauts to to a safe landing on the surface of the moon. I can't even imagine printing out all the software that exists on just a robotic space vehicle today. So greater technology can achieve greater things. It can also cause, you know, expose us to other kinds of risk. So it's really hard for me to compare. Anytime I look back at the Apollo program, I'm just stunned by the achievements. And it's, you know, I guess the Apollo program serves as a good reminder that you can't let risk frighten you, that the only way to achieve great things is to accept great risks and to press forward as best as you can. How many of them blew up? Apollo 8, does Apollo 8 blew up? And Apollo 13. Apollo 1. Apollo 1. And then there was the big uh, in-flight problem with Apollo 13. But, you know, there were, there were a lot of uh, moments on the Apollo missions that we got lucky. But then, again, you don't get lucky if you don't take risks. So I'm not telling people not to take the risk of going to Mars. I just, uh, you know, I hope that people take acceptable risks and don't uh, ignore risks that could wind up causing unnecessary death and suffering. Well, what's cool about this is for a space advocate, you're actually not full of, you know, incredible human hubris. I mean, there's a certain, <laughs> you know, willing, wanting to preserve the Mars uh, aerosphere or biosphere or whatever you like to call it before we get down there. But, you know, discovering whether there might be, in fact, life have been or is life on there before we, you know, our own microbes and, and human animal cells find their way onto the surface. So that's interesting. And and also, you know, I mean, you certainly couldn't be accused of being drunk on on space hubris or drunk <laughs> drunk on any of that. No, you're you're sounding in a sense a cautionary tone. So that's that's interesting. I didn't expect that. Before we wrap up, I just want to ask you, so uh you're a red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars fan. Any other top either nonfiction or, oh, oh, you haven't asked you about your book. So tell us what your book is. Tell us one awesome science fiction book that everybody has to read. Okay, so my book is called The Design and Engineering of Curiosity, and it's all about the design and engineering of the Curiosity rover. It's actually the first of two books I'm writing about Curiosity. I found that I had to write this one in order to understand the rover and how it worked well enough to be able to write about the scientific story, which is what I'm working on right now. So any question you ever had about what that thing is on the rover, I answer it in this book. I also, one of the things that I sought to do, you know, a lot of the papers that are written about this mission were written before it launched. And so things as flown are never quite the same as things as planned. And so I worked very hard in this book with engineers to make sure that I knew everything that had happened to the rover, when things broke, how they got fixed, you know, stuff like that. So that it's as complete a guide as I can possibly make to how the rover works for anybody who's either a fan or a professional working on the mission. Crazy. That's cool. Questions you have and questions you didn't know that you had. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Roger, that's great. And what about where would you steer people want to read some cool stuff about space that you think is hard? You talk about hard science fiction, which is also my favorite. What's, uh, what's your fave there? Uh, this is, it's pretty hard science fiction, but the, uh, a book that I'm always recommending to people and that people often haven't heard of it is, a, is an old book by an author named C.J. Chera. It's called The Pride of Chainer. It's a book about uh, the main characters are these alien sort of cat people, but you're she's so good at developing characters and personalities. And one of the main events, uh, the central plot line in this book is that an alien suddenly uh, escapes the confines that this alien has was uh, imprisoned by another group of aliens. And this alien runs to these cat people ship and gets on board. And, and you realize soon that it's actually a human, but nobody's ever seen a human before. And so you see this human through the eyes of these aliens. And it's just fascinating because you can't tell if the human is actually not quite sane, or if it's just that the aliens just don't understand humans, or it's just absolutely fascinating, really great stuff, really dramatic. I would have bet money you couldn't have named a science fiction book I hadn't read. Now you've just done. 
All right. All right. We'll definitely check it out. Links to all that in the show notes, links to Emily's book in the show notes, links to the Planetary Society in the show notes, links to Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars in the science terms, links to some images in the, if you want interested in images of Ryugu or Hayabusa or some of the things they haven't quite got to today. So in respect of uh, Emily's time, uh, we're going to perhaps draw a line under it. Emily, any final thoughts or words for listeners, uh, what they can do? Just come to our website at planetary.org and follow the adventures of all the spacecraft exploring the solar system. Very, very cool. Thank you. That's absolutely marvelous. Thanks very much for your time. And thanks for listening. That wraps up our show with Emily. We talked about a real nerd book Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. It's a trilogy, and uh, each of them are substantial. But by an author called Kim Stanley Robinson, who's definitely one of my favorites, one of my top five, maybe my top two science fiction authors of all time. So here's the question. What would happen if a hundred of the greatest minds on Earth, accompanied by their therapist, just in case of psychological emergencies, built a colony on Mars, perhaps starting around 2040? What makes Kim Stanley Robinson such a great hard science fiction writer is his grasp of engineering, of biomedicine, of space science, areology, which is geology for Mars, physics, chemistry, and more. But what makes the book special is not that stuff, but the social science stuff. What kind of society? Would it be capitalism? If not, what? Would it be a democracy? But what about minority interests? Would it remain an Earth colony or seek independence? Would it be terraform it to make it more Earth-like? which is certainly going to be possible in the sorts of timescales the book talks about starts in 2040 and the whole trilogy goes for hundreds of years. Or would we try and preserve the aesthetic and scientific purity of Mars? So that's a question that the book really tries to get grips with. And as you can perhaps tell by the progression of the colors of the trilogy, red Mars, green Mars, blue Mars, the terraformers win, but not without a struggle. So a great book, and I put a link to it in the show notes if you're interested. It's certainly, certainly, definitely, if you're a sci-fi not worth the read, and even non-sci-fi people I've recommended it to have said it's been marvelous. On another note, I'm looking forward to the second season of Ozark, which starts in a few days. If you haven't given that show a world, check it out. It's somewhat like Breaking Bad, but it's set in roughneck country in, surprise, surprise, the Ozarks. So definitely, definitely worth a watch. And thank you for listening to Think Bigger, Think Better. Remember to review the podcast on iTunes and tell me so, so that I can send you a free book by one of our best-selling authors or support it on Patreon for as little as $5 an episode. In fact, might, maybe even as little as $1 an episode. Or join our new Facebook page, which I creatively called Think Bigger, Think Better, where discussions of our topics are already starting to happen. And now I'll leave you with the voice of my favorite leader. Thanks for listening. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy to make our world a better place. Mm -hmm.